lovely to see you all. Um, lovely to see so many familiar faces as well. It's been quite a long time since I've been down sort of Surrey way and it's, um, yeah, I, I miss it. and I miss the shop very much too. So this is quite nice to still have that link with you all, which is really lovely. Um, yeah, as Emma said, um, I'm a needlework uh, teacher and designer um, and yeah, have embraced Zoom in the last sort of 12 months, which I never thought I would. I didn't even know what it was this time last year. Um, but now I'm teaching a lot with it and I think it's it's given a lot of people a bit of a lifeline as far as things to do in lockdown um, and all that kind of stuff so it's um, my trusty little camera that I have here um, I have a camera um, on my display frame so um, I'll switch over to that in a second but if anybody has any questions as we go through um, if you want to unmute yourselves um, and just ask me that's fine. If you don't want to actually speak on the video, if you type it in the little chat box at the bottom of the screen, um, Emma will keep an eye on that and then she'll ask the question for you. Um, and I'm happy for questions to happen as we go through. You don't need to save it all till the end. Um, that's fine. Um, so what I was gonna do was um, show you uh, four really simple, quite basic stitches. Probably most of you have come across those before, but if you haven't, I'll show you how to do those too. Um, and then also variations on those four basic stitches. There's quite a lot of things you could do um, just with a handful of really simple techniques. So I'm just gonna switch my camera over to my other frame. Um, fingers crossed this works. There we go. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, so this is a little sample that um, I worked well did last night and this morning actually I kind of went oh I need to show you something so um, I've stitched this um, just on a, a little bit of um, needlework fabric that I have it happens to be a, an even weave fabric which um, is quite nice because you know you can get dead straight lines then um, but all of these stitches on here are variations of four different stitches so um, running stitch, back stitch, chain stitch, and herringbone stitch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and they're all quite um, the sort of thing that you learn when you're first starting off in hand sewing and embroidery. So these have all been worked with um, perlay threads. So I've used a mixture of um, the DMC or anchor uh, perlay thread that comes on the ball like that which are quite nice. But I've also used um, one of the packets of the uh, Out of Africa, the House of Embroidery Perlay threads, which are all hand dyed. Um, these are in these gorgeous sunset colors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I love these because they're, they're, some of them are, the variation in color is slightly different. They're all hand dyed. So you get these lovely subtle variations in the tones of the colors. Um, as well as you get three threads that will go together. You get three in a, in a packet as well. Um, and there's uh, probably about 50 different color combinations, I think, if not more. And I think I think they're all on their website, I think, Emma, aren't they? Yes, they're on our website. I think there's actually no yeah. two or so. Is there? Yes. Okay, I was trying to remember. It's been a while, but I couldn't remember. Um, but they're lovely and they're, they're really lovely to stitch with. They give you a nice, cause it's a, a twisted thread. So it gives you a nice, um, a nice defined stitch as you're, um, as you're working. So they're really lovely to work with. So I've used those three colors and then the purple and the green in the DMC pearly thread. Um, and if for those of you, the, the pearly I've been using is a number eight. Um, and then the Out of Africa threads are very slightly thicker. So for those of you who kind of know about thread numbers and thicknesses, just to give you an idea, it's, it's very hard to tell the scale of things on Zoom, I've discovered. Um, but they're roughly about the same kind of um, thickness. So it's about a number eight in the Perlay, if anyone's interested in that. Um, so like I said, I've got running stitches. So like the top of here in the green, it's a plain running stitch. But then I've also got a back stitch just here. Um, and then slight variations on those. So this little bit here, I've got a running stitch and I've just stitched a bead in between each one. Um, this with the green here is a running stitch, which I've laced another thread through. 
So that's another variation of that. This one with the purple and the pink here is a purple backstitch um, with another thread sort of run through it, which is called a Pekingese stitch, like that. Um, and then I've got chain stitches. So a plain chain stitch in the orange just here, but then this chain stitch has um, a little seed bead stitched into the middle of each chain again, which is, is quite, quite a simple thing to do, but it looks really effective. Um, I have another chain stitch here in purple, which has got um, one side of it's been whipped with an orange thread. So I'm gonna show you how to do that one as well. And then the pink here, which is a herringbone stitch, um, which is one of those stitched, all these stitches really are, um, particularly the herringbone stitch, they're practical stitches as well as being decorative. So they're quite often used in dressmaking as well. Um, but with this herringbone here, it's for decoration. So with this one, I've just put another seed bead in between each sort of diagonal stitch. This one, I've stitched the um, pink herringbone first and then worked the green over the top, but wo woven it under and over the pink stitches so you get this interlaced effect. And then the herringbone at the top here, um, again, it's a normal herringbone stitch, but I've tied it at the top with little vertical stitches in green. Um, you know, you could make those longer or you could make them into cross stitches and put another stitch over there. So there are lots of different variations um, that you can achieve just by using a handful of fairly simple stitches. So I'm just going to um, swap my frames over now so I can do some demonstrations. Oops. Okay. So, yeah, this is, like I said, it's a piece of um, needlework fabric. It's an even weave fabric. I think it's a Laguna or Lagana um, even weave, which I think is about a 26 count, I think, if anyone's, but you can do this just as easily on quilting cotton. Um, a lot of these stitches as well, you can use in um, crazy quilting. So if you've ever done that lovely, kind of haphazard mismatch um, type of quilting that then you decorate the seams um, with hand stitching. Um, you can use all of these on that as well. So there's um, lots of different ways you can, you can use them. So I'm just gonna start uh, a bit straighter, just with a simple running stitch, which probably I would imagine most of you know, but I'll just, um, I've attached the thread up here and you're just working even stitches of the same length across the fabric and leaving um, the same gap between each one as well. So I'll just do a couple more of those. So you bring the needle up and then take the needle down. I'm using an embroidery hoop for this. Um, very often um, quilters find it easier to stitch with the fabric in your hand. Um, all of these stitches, you can do that, but because of my training, I find that really difficult. So I have to put the fabric in a hoop, which is what this is. So yeah, for the simple running stitch, you're just going up and down like that. So because I'm using an even weave linen, linen and I'm using um, the holes as a guideline of the linen, I'm using a tapestry needle. Um, this is a number 24 tapestry needle, the sort of thing that you'd use for cross stitch, just because it makes it easier to stitch through the holes. But if you were using a quilting cotton, you'd obviously use a sharp needle, um, a number 24 chenille or a sort of a number six embroidery needle would be fine. So that's our kind of basic running stitch like that. And then simple things that you can do to jazz that up a bit. Um, so you can do a just going to thread up a piece of the perlay thread. One sh thing I should mention about the perlay thread is um, I would never use um, a length that's more than 30 centimetres, so about 12 inches, because it loses its shine and its twist. If it's too long, um, it becomes fluffy and starts to untwist. So if you keep your lengths of thread a bit shorter, um, you get much better stitching. So I'm going to just show you the whipped, the whipped stitch. 
So once you've put your running stitch in, you can whip it with the same colour or you can choose a contrasting colour. So I'm going to use this lovely sort of red orange colour. So I'm just going to bring my needle up at the beginning of that line. Um, this doesn't matter if you're left handed. Um, it doesn't matter whether you work from right to left or left to right either. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. So to whip the stitch, you're going to take your needle underneath the first running stitch. You're not going through the fabric at all. And then you're going to take the needle underneath the second running stitch from the same direction. And you're going to keep repeating that. So you're coming underneath each, st each stitch. You're not working through the fabric at all. Oops. So you get that lovely kind of slightly stripy um, kind of candy cane effect, which I think is really lovely, like that. Um, a slight variation of that is, and to finish, if you were finishing your whipping, you take the needle down at the end of your last stitch, like that. To achieve a slightly different technique, uh, effect I should say, is rather than going from the same direction each time, you can go up and down and up and down that way. So if we go down through that one, Okay, I have got one question. Is this just as easy with a needle that has a point at the end, or would you turn the needle around? If you're if you're stitching with a pointed needle, I would turn the needle around, yes, or swap to a tapestry needle at this point. Um, so by turning the needle around, um, you would just you would use the eye end of the needle first, and that way you're not catching the thread of the running stitch or the fabric like that. Thank you. So you get a slightly different effect by doing it up and down like that. You get a much wavier line. So, you know, if you were doing, I don't know, some sort of picture that had C in it or that kind of thing, you get this lovely wavy line. And because the, the contrasting thread is pulling the running stitches, it almost makes them look slightly diagonal. So you get a slightly different effect with that again, and then again, you can take your needle down at the bottom through the end of the last stitch, like that. For all of these stitches, you can finish your thread by weaving it through onto the back if you want to, um, or if you're using a chenille needle or a, a pointed needle of some sort, I'm just gonna swap this round so I can show you. Um, one way of starting and finishing your threads is take the needle down where you want to finish and then you can actually angle your needle out from underneath your stitching and take little tiny stitches, little tiny pin stitches underneath your embroidery stitching. Two is enough. Um, so if you want to you know, keep the back of it as neat as possible. Um, that's one way of finishing, but weaving it through on the back is absolutely fine too. And then you can bring your needle up to the top and snip that off really close to the fabric. And I'm keeping the blades of the scissors sort of flat against the fabric rather than cutting it like that. If you do it that way, you're going to be able to cut much closer to the fabric like that. So there's that's two, two of the variations of a, um, a running stitch. With the back stitch, the oh, threading needles live is never that easy. There we go, right. Um, with a back stitch, you're starting off in a similar way to a running stitch, but instead of stitching forwards, you're stitching down into the previous, into the end of the previous stitch. like that. You can also do this as a double running stitch. So you would work a normal running stitch and then go back and fill the gaps. It depends on which one you, I find doing it as a back stitch kind of gives you a slightly smoother line though, really. So 
So with this stitch, you can do um, both of the, the variations that we've just done on the running stitch. You can weave the thread through and do the whipping. Both of those will work. Um, but one of my favorite variations on the back stitch um, is a pick and ease stitch, um, which I will show you. So I'm just gonna leave that there. Thread up a different, let's go with the orange, I think. So this gives you a nice sort of almost lacy effect. So instead of coming up through the end of my first stitch, I'm actually kind of come up just below it like that. And then again, you're going to be weaving the needle under your stitches. So either swap to a tapestry needle or use the eye end of the needle for this. So you're going to take your needle underneath the second stitch in your row. And then pull the thread through and then take it down underneath the first stitch. So you're going underneath your first stitch, but over your contrasting thread. And what that does is puts a loop like that on the top of your back stitch row. So you're not going to pull it tight, you're going to leave it like that. You want it to have this lovely kind of curly whirly effect. So then you're going to take the needle up underneath the third stitch in your row. And then down underneath the second one. And again, you're going under your stitch and, oops, Daisy, over your contrasting thread. And again, you're not pulling it super tight. You want to keep that lovely sort of loopy thing. So you keep going like that. You're coming up underneath an empty stitch and then going down through the previous stitch. You might have to kind of fiddle with the loops a little bit and just poke them so that they do what they're told. But you get this lovely kind of lacy stitch. If you've got um, any metallic threads, which if you've ever used them to stitch with, they don't like going through material at all but they're perfect for this kind of thing because you're not putting as much stress on them as you are if you were stitching through the fabric. So you get these lovely little loopy. Uh, what was this stitch called? This was stitched with Pekingese? Pekingese Pekin stitch it's called. I'm not sure why, <laughs> I don't know. So, um, so that's your Pekingese stitch, but you get this lovely kind of loopy loopy thing. So and then when you're going to fit when you when you want to finish doing that, if you're taking it down again, just below your stitch, your back stitch is like that. So that gives you that it's a lovely edging stitch because it has this lovely lacy effect. Um, and as I mentioned, you can quite easily do both of the above stitches with the back stitch too. If you just get a slightly um, Sort of tighter twisted look if I just put this in for you quickly. Because there are more stitches you get more of a um, almost like a candy cane effect. It looks really good for Christmas stuff this stitch. So that's just a whipped whipped back stitch by doing that like that. So how are we doing for God? time goes very quickly, doesn't it? Right. So I'm just going to switch over to the um, chain stitch, which is here. So for a chain stitch, <clears throat> your thread is coming out of your fabric and then you're taking your fabric, your needle down into the same hole almost or very, very close to it. You're leaving a loop on the surface of the fabric. And then you're going to bring your needle up through the loop and then pull it in the direction that you're stitching so that you're encouraging that loop to sit nice and flat against the fabric. Then you take your needle down into the loop to create a second loop, bring the needle up through that loop 
and then you have another chain. So as the name suggests, they are all linked, all the stitches are linked together, um, very much like a chain. So as it's, if you've ever done lazy daisy stitch as well, that's just a single one of these stitches. It's something I think was the first thing my grandma ever taught me to do is lazy daisy stitch. So that's a chain stitch. Um, to finish the chain, you're just gonna take a little stitch over your last loop like that and that holds that down like that so as it is that's quite a nice stitch to do but so if you can hear any banging and crashing outside it's market day today and all the traders are taking their um stalls down and as i'm in a very old building there is no double glazing or soundproofing so no matter what's going on we hear it um, you should just be grateful that the buskers stopped playing because normally we can hear that on a Saturday class. So, <laughs> um, so for your um, chain stitch, you can either leave it like that or um, there's a couple of different things you can do. So one of the most effective I quite like to do is just simply do a back stitch through the middle of it. So you're bringing your needle up inside one of the loops, stitching over the point where those two chains are joined and take it down to the second loop. Bring it up in that loop and then take it down into the end of that stitch that you've just created. So especially when you use a really bright contrasting thread, um, it looks really pretty. So that's just putting a simple back stitch through the middle of your chain stitch like that. Works better this when your chains aren't too small. These are quite big ones, um, but it still looks looks pretty good, I think. So that's a quite a nice variation on a chain stitch. Um, and then the other thing which I quite like to do with chain stitches um, is add a whipping stitch. So you've worked your chain stitches, bring your needle up. I do apologize for the banging. Bring your needle up um, at the sort of point a meeting and then the same way you did with your back stitch you're gonna just on one side on this top edge of your chain stitch take your needle through the loop and out the other side through the loop and out the other side like that and again this works really well with metallic thread so you can do it like that so you get this lovely twisted edge and you can either do it and leave it on one side, like that, take the needle down at that point, um, or you can do it on both sides. So I'm just going to bring the needle up again. And do the same thing on the other side. So again, none of these things are hugely complicated, but they are really effective. You know, and with this one, if you want to get really carried away, you could put a running stitch down the middle with a different colored thread as well. Um, or add some beads to it or anything like that. So I don't know if you can see that very well. So that's sort of two variations of a chain stitch. And then the last um, basic stitch I wanted to show you was the herringbone stitch, um, which if you've ever done any dressmaking, it's used a lot for stitching hems up and canvas into jackets and all sorts of things, but um, <clears throat> it's also used a lot for hand embroidery. It's used also for shadow work embroidery. So if you were to work this um, so that these diagonal stitches were on the back on a, a very, you know, a nice sort of a, um, like a cotton lawn or an organza or something, then you add, you can sort of see the colour through the fabric almost as, as a shadow, hence the name shadow work. So this, this stitch can be worked both ways round. Um, but in this case, we are um, working a diagonal stitch and then you're going to come back on yourself a little way but on the same line and then work a um, diagonal stitch down 
I'm just using the holes as a reference so that I get it straight um, down to the bottom line. Come back on yourself a little way. and then back up to the top. So you're working a series of diagonal stitches. And you can vary the height of this stitch and you can vary the distance between the diagonals. So you can work it, um, you know, if you wanted to work it much closer together. Then you can do it that way as well. So there's lots of variations within a single stitch, really. And then things that you can do with your herringbone stitch. Uh, let's just get some more of this nice bright thread. So like I said, you can work another herringbone stitch on top of this and kind of layer them up um, or you can interlace it with another contrasting thread and again you can use metallic threads for this that would look quite good so if you wanted to interlace it I'm going to bring my needle up at the same point there and then I'm going to come underneath that stitch over that point where the threads cross and then back under that one. And then are the uh, metallic threads also perle threads or are they different? You can, you can get metallic perle threads, yeah. I don't have any actually here, but you can get, but DMC and Anchor do stranded um, metallic thread, which is, it looks beautiful, but it's really hard to sew with when you have it in the needle and you're pulling it up and down through the fabric because it, it splits and it rips and it sounds horrible and everything but when you're doing this kind of thing because you're not putting so much stress on the thread um it's much easier to control um and it doesn't the, you know the metallic outer sort of paper doesn't rip um so it's quite a nice a nice way to use it because they can be really horrible to stitch with so I'm just it going it through the fabric. I'm, I guess it, it doesn't, as you say, it doesn't take the stress as much. Yeah, it doesn't. Not at all. Not at all. So again, I'm not pulling these too tight because you want to keep that lovely wavy effect. So I'm going each time just taking my needle up and underneath the herringbone and then down underneath the second. like that. And then when you've got to the end of where you want to stitch, take it down into the bottom of a, an arm, so to speak, like that. So you get a lovely kind of wavy, wavy effect. Um, the other one that I was um, going to show you is you can do um, a thing called a tied herringbone, which is basically where you um, take a stitch over point where your stitches cross like that so you can make them all vertical um, or you could go a bit off piste and you could do the top ones horizontal like that so you can kind of alternate it around like that Um, or if you wanted to, you could put horizontal and vertical over the same one. Depends on the thread you're using and, um, you know, the effect that you want to create. You could do that kind of thing with it as well. I'm just going to lift my frame up so you can see that bit clearer, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, so there's a kind of, there's lots of different things you can do just with those four stitches. Um, can be really quite effective. So there was a, a question earlier, which was on when you were doing the back stitch, I think it was, but we moved on. 
yeah is whether you could do it like a loose straight stitch on your machine on mm -hmm. a quilt and then do the decoration bit so like the Pekingese bit um on it after you've done the, the main bulk of your quilting on your machine um, yeah if you did it with a top stitch thread rather than just with a um uh with a machine thread something a little thicker possibly Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think you'd need to do it looser, maybe just longer than normal. Because if, if your back stitch is too loose or, or too long with a um, Pekingese, what happens is these don't stay put. Because the, um, the Pekingese bit of the stitch is quite loose, um, they can quite easily, um, I mean, you can see with that one there, because I've skipped along and used that, the same thread for the whipping, it's pulled that one so, you know, these are quite easily distorted. So if you don't, if you did a machine stitch, yes, that would absolutely work, but I would make it slightly longer rather than looser. Mm. Otherwise all of this will move around too much. Okay. Um, but you could, yeah, definitely. That would save an awful lot of time. Definitely it would. That's actually quite a good idea. I like that. <laughs> I won't know who asked that question. Um, <laughs> Another question, when the beads are added, what threads do you use to add the beads? I, I just use a sewing thread. So, I mean, I, I, the ones I've got here, this happens to be a roll of Gutterman, um, but you could just as easy, easily use metal or something like that. Um, it depends on, if you're doing something with a finer sewing thread, um, you can use it with the, stitch the beads on with the sewing thread. Um, but because the, these beads that I had, they were a size 10, um, the holes are quite small. So um, I used a, a size 10 embroidery needle to stitch it just with a single piece of sewing thread. So it doesn't have to be beading thread, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, just um, probably if you're doing something where um, it's going to be use so if it is on a quilt or a bag I'd maybe use um, a double like two strands of thread just to make sure that it's um, strong enough I think but if you're doing something that's just going to be in a frame or something that's not going to get you know knocked around or worn or anything like that then a single strand would be fine um, and I normally I either match the thread to my background colour um, or to the beads it depends on what I'm doing with them really. Um, so, I mean, I'll just drop the thread over, uh, frame over again, hang on a second. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to mention was to sort of make the, the sample a bit more interesting. I mean, you can just fill, you know, it's, it's a nice way to do um, just a, a stitch sampler, really. You know, you can get, um, this is a six inch hoop, this one, it's quite little, um, but you can just do rows that fill the circle. Um, but for this, I thought it would be quite nice to do it in a shape. So what I did was um, I just cut a, um, a piece of paper, folded it in half and drew a heart on it. Um, and then if you lay that against your fabric or you can pin it, um, and then there's two ways of um, transferring a design line on that isn't permanent. So you can either pin it on and then tack around your shape so not through the car, uh, paper but just right on the edge tack around it with a, um, a sharp needle and a bit of sewing thread so that you have a running stitch outline which then you can take out when you've put all your stitching in um, or the other thing which I quite like which I do use a lot is the um, the water erasable pens um, I tend to use the this is a what is this this is a hemline one but I like the, the ones that have got a really fine nib on them. The ones that are more like a felt tip, um, depending on the fabric you're using, the, the line bleeds quite often and it gets too big. Um, so these are brilliant because you can just, once your stitching's done, if you just um, mist it with a, a plant spray bottle with a bit of water in it or dab it with a damp tissue, the line will disappear. You don't have to soak it. Um, just maybe double check that your embroidery threads are colour flasked before you have a go at that. And if, it's, if they're new threads, they will be, but some, I've got quite a lot of old threads that people have given me. So I do quite often have to just check that they are colour fast because you don't always know. 
Um, but that's quite a nice way of putting a design on. Then you fill the shape with your stitching. Um, and then once it's finished, you can get rid of the line after. Um, the other thing I've seen people do, which works really well with this kind of technique, is if you've got um, any cookie cutters, you can use those for your um, for the sort of outline and just draw around it. Or if you want to do a circle or another type of shape, you can do that too. Um, so yeah, these these work quite well for that sort of thing as well. But I, I personally, I would steer clear of the ones that that disappear in air. Um, if you're doing a longer project because they disappear way too quick and you'll get halfway through and then you'll come back to it and you'll realise your design has vanished because it's, it's done its job and it's gone. Um, so for something that's not permanent but lasts a bit longer, um, then these are my favourite. I know some people quite like friction pens as well, but I quite like those. Really? Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of, I mean, it's half an hour is very quick, isn't it? It goes much quicker than you think. Yeah. <laughs> and all of those stitches that you've demonstrated today are you've used in, in this sampler. So it just goes to show us what, what we yeah. can do. That's, yeah, that, that is all, there's nothing else in here. There's just those four stitches and then variations on those. So it's just, you know, I mean, there's a couple of other bits that we didn't get quite get around to, but, um, like this, this piece here is a back stitch, and then I've I've laced the thread, but rather than pulling it tight, I've left it a bit more like a pick and ease and left it sticking out the top and the bottom. Um, this one here is a chain stitch, but I've um, whipped it with a pink thread. So rather than just whipping one side of it, I've whipped the whole chain. So it doesn't look like a chain anymore, but what happens is you get a lovely thick line of stitching which is quite raised. That's quite nice too. Uh, what else? Oh, this one here. I've just done pairs of um, little horizontal stitches here and here, and then done the lacing. So you, again, you get a slightly different effect again, but it's the same stitches. Um, so there's kind of endless possibilities, really. You can sort of play around with it and um, just have a bit. It's quite nice just to have a bit of a fiddle, isn't it, sometimes, I think. So has anybody else got any other questions about anything? Yeah, Kay here. Um, Could you show us how you um, did the uh, signing off the, the knot, the um, little stitches that you were doing? Yep, I can. Let me just... And have you got a, a special way of um, actually threading the thread on without a knot? Um, yeah, kind of. Hang on, let me just start with this again. So if I was gonna, let's just snip that off there. Um, you have to use a sharp needle if you're gonna use this. Okay. Technique. So, um, I mean, this, this is a way that we get taught the RSN. And the reason for that is because a lot of the work we do is on very big frames, something called a slate frame, which this, it's a basically it's a rectangular embroidery frame, but they can be really big, like um, you know, as big as a dining table quite often. Um, and part of the reason for finishing and starting threads this way is so that you don't have to keep turning your um, embroidery over to start and finish your threads. Because when we're working on big frames, um, there's quite often several of us all sat around, it's a bit like sat around a dining table, but we're all stitching. So this method, apart from um, it does reduce the bulk on the back of your work, depending on what you're going to do with it. But um, it's, so it's sort of a twofold reason why we do it. So if you wanted to start your thread, you're going to take your needle down through the fabric so that your knot is on the top of the work, like that. And then you're going to do two really tiny little back stitches, almost like little pin stitches. The smaller you can make them, the better um, because you're going to stitch over them so they're not on top of each other they're just next to each other so if you're using a cotton or a woolen thread two stitches is enough and then bring your needle up where you want to start stitching and then you're going to get hold of that little knotted end get hold of the tufty end and snip it off with the scissors and again I've got the scissors um, flat against the fabric like that. 
So you haven't got a knot on the front or the back. Um, and then you're going to work so that you're working over those starting stitches that you've just done. So you need them to be small because you want to be able to hide them. So you'd always do those stitches somewhere that's going to be covered. So if you're stitching a line, um, those stitches need to be on the, the line that you're going to stitch. If you're going to stitch um, a filled shape, you can just do them in the middle of the shape. But you still need to make them quite small. So you work your line of stitching until you've got to the end. And then when you want to finish your thread, you're gently going to bring your needle up. So it's almost coming out from underneath your last stitch. So if I roll, move my needle, you can see it's pushing that stitch over. So it's this needle's not going through the last stitch at all. And then you're going to do the tiniest little tiny back stitch again. Not through that stitch, but just underneath it, you're hiding them. And two is enough. So I'm sort of angling my needle rather than going straight up and down, I'm angling it so that you can get the point of it underneath that stitch. And then bring the thread up to the top and pulling it up very slightly and then snip it off really close. So then so you've finished your work with it and started it without having to turn your frame over. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. That's all right. Anybody got Does anybody else have any questions? No, oh, really good. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Kay. That's been really informative. Um, and you do obviously do online classes. Um, we haven't been able to arrange any for, for us, but you do do other online classes and you also sell your kits on Etsy, I believe, don't you? So I do. Yeah, the, the stock is rather low at the moment because I've sold a lot, which is amazing. But um, it seems that the summer's going to be really busy. So I'm now frantically making kits for things that I didn't think were going to happen that are going to happen. And it's all like, ah. Oh. Um, but yeah, if um, there's always information on my website, it's not always the most up to date, but you can sign up for a newsletter. So um, every now and again, not as regularly as Emma, I'm not that organized, um, but I do send newsletters out when I've got new kits in the Etsy shop um, and that kind of thing. So you know, if you're interested about finding out more about what I do, um, then you can have a look at the website, which is katebarlowembroidery.com. Sorry, could you repeat that, please? It, it's katebarlowembroidery.com. Thank you. Um, and I do have um, one of the, my kits is for sale with Val at Just Hands On as well. 